We will be looking at uh, chapter 4, 17, or 7 through 17. Uh, before we begin, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray and ask that your spirit would be here with me today and that you would, you would move me out of the way, Lord, and your spirit would come through. God, you would increase in this place and the hearts of your people would grow, would grow fonder for you and for your glory. Lord, I pray you would open our eyes that are so distracted by these things of the world, I pray you would open them to the truth of heaven. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be softened and that they would be cultivated and the seeds of your word, which is truth, would sanctify us and set us apart from the world, that we would come out from the world and be your people and walk in community to, to glorify you, Lord, to be a witness on earth. So God, please come now. Please Please bring your, your power, I need it. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so, today we will conclude the book of Colossians uh, with the final greetings of Paul to the believers there in Colossae. But we're going to also have, have a summary of the entire book. A jet tour through the book of Colossians. This way... Uh, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit would jar our memory from what we've learned so far. And also, if this is your first time, uh, you can get kind of an overview of the, of the book of Colossians. Colossae was a town in which there was a church located in Asia Minor. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to them in around 62 A.D. So, Jesus was crucified around 33 A.D. So it's about 30 years later, after he uh, had been crucified and ascended to heaven. The church had begun to grow from Jerusalem into Samaria, into Judea, and now has begun to go out into the Roman Greek world. Paul himself had never visited this church. At this time he was arrested and he was in prison. But he wasn't in like a dungeon prison that we think of when we think of prison. He was actually in a house. It was a house that he rented, but he was chained with a, with a Roman guard with him all the time. He was a Roman citizen, so he had a little bit more rights than just the average Joe of that time. And so he began to write these letters. God sovereignly put him there so that he could write these letters and encourage these new believers, these new baby Christians. He could encourage them how they are to come together together. As a, as a group, as an assembly, and be called out from the world, and how to act, what to believe. A lot of these people were coming from pagan backgrounds or Jewish backgrounds. So he was teaching them this new mystery of one body being created, the wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile being knocked down. A Gentile is anyone that is not a Jew, so that makes all of us into one family for his glory. Now, this letter was read in one sitting at the church of Colossae. Kind of like a little body like this. Whoever received the letter, one of their elders, got the letter and read it to the group. It was to them. And it was read in one sitting. And then they took the letter and they circulated around the other churches in the area. And we'll find out in chapter 4, there was a letter written to a church at Laodicea. It was another town down the road. And Paul tells them to take that letter and read it and circulate them. That's what we're to do here. In the book of Acts chapter 2, it says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Well, we are to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. We have their writings. We have the letters of Paul. We have the letter of John, the apostle John, James brother of Jesus, Peter. These are for us because the teaching came from Jesus Christ. We're not to be devoted to anything else. We're not to be devoted to man's books in the bookstores. We're to be devoted to God's book and His teaching. And so they read it in one sitting. They didn't take three and a half months to read it, like we have. 
But that's okay. God's intent is that we would study, right? So we've been looking at individual trees as we've gone through every single verse. Today we're going to kind of look at the forest, the bigger picture of chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. And the final greetings doesn't have a whole lot of golden nugget doctrine within them. But there's some observations I think that we can take away. So that's what we're going to do today. There are two overarching themes in the book of Colossians. Number one, the supremacy of Jesus Christ. There is no authority above Christ. He is the Lord God Almighty. And Paul establishes that. The second one is, is that Christians are to exist in a community in which the Bible calls the body of Christ. So my prayer is that we would remember what God's intent was originally to the Colossian believers and then also how that intent relates to us today, 2,000 years later. So, chapter 1. First, Paul addresses this. He says, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. What this teaches us is that Christians exist in community. Paul writes to the faithful, the faithful saints and brothers. That's a family. Brothers and sisters exist in a family, not outside a family. So we are to exist inside community. And Paul loved these people even though he hadn't met them. How many people do you love that you haven't met? He loved them and he prayed day and night for them. That's another thing we learn here. Look at verse 3. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. The mark of a Christian is love for one another. Jesus Christ said that. They will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. I hear that verse used all the time to go as, as motivation to go and feed homeless under a bridge. That's not the intent of that verse. Even though it's good to feed the homeless. It's good to take care of the poor. Absolutely. But primarily that means to love one another inside the church. And I, I, I taught a couple of weeks ago that if you're not loving one another inside the church, everything you do outside of the church is fake. It's all fake. It's hypocritical. If you're fighting and constantly bickering at each other, but then you go feed the homeless, you think God's lo He likes that? No. Not at all. He says you will be like the hypocrites, thrown out. Right? Gnashing and weeping of teeth. Gnashing of teeth and weeping. Sorry, got that backwards. Okay, so we also learned that we must pray for one another and for each other to grow. So here's a question. As we're going through this, you'll find that I'm wanting this sermon to be more practical of what we've learned already. So here's a question to take home. Who are you praying for to grow in the faith and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Number one, you should be praying for yourself that you would grow. God's intent is for not us to stay babies and drink milk all the time. Read Hebrews chapter 5. We are to grow just like a baby does, just like my little, little baby back there. He has milk to begin with, then we go to squash and some sweet potatoes. He doesn't like the greens so much, but then we move on. He's going to move on to meat. We are to do the same thing. So pray for yourself. If you're married, you need to be praying for your spouse. If you're not married, you need to be praying for your future spouse. God knows who they are. And then your children. Primarily, that's the start. Then you pray for people in your church. Then outside the church, friends, family, people at work, people at school. It also says here that we are to grow with knowledge and truth and wisdom. You cannot do that outside of the Scripture, outside of what God has revealed as truth. There's not other truth. There's not, it's not... Uh, the Bible and other faiths. No, there's one faith. The rest are counterfeit to deceive, to bring you away from truth. 
Satan doesn't care what it is as long as it's not centered on Jesus Christ. Now, we also learned in verse 15, Paul begins to destroy an argument. The Colossians had come under spiritual attack. They were being told that Christ was not God. They were being told that Christ was more like an angel, a messenger, a prophet. But he was not God, and he wasn't even physical. So Paul begins to destroy it. And what I want us to do is to destroy any argument that comes up in your mind that diminishes Jesus Christ. To make him out to be a mere man. Look at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. We establish that that means that he has every right. He has the birthright of the creation. Not that he was first born like as if he was created, like the Jehovah's Witness say. No, this means that he had every right to the creation as position, a position. Why? For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions, Rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Is there any other argument? Is there anyone that doubts now that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and he created all things? He is the one that said, let there be light. He is the one that created your nose, your eyelashes. He's the one that decided the sovereign color of your eyes. And he says, every single hair on your head is numbered. Sparrow doesn't fall from a tree apart from God's will. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But yet we run and fret like little rats in a race. Rather than bowing the knee before the Father and saying, God, I need. And Jehovah Jireh, the God our provider, comes through. Christ comes through because all things hold together by his power the entire universe the sun was to move an inch one way or the other we'd freeze or burn up it's all by his power and for his glory we also learned here that the mystery that Paul preached he went around talking about this mystery well they didn't understand the Jews didn't understand about the triune God the Father the Son, who is the Word, who becomes flesh, and the Holy Spirit. They didn't get that. But through this mystery, it was revealed that Christ, God Almighty, when you put your faith in Him, and you bow the knee to Him, and you receive Him, He gives you the right to become His child. And He places His Spirit inside of you. That was completely foreign before this time. The prophets had the Shekinah glory of God upon them. The word of God would come and appear to them and give them a message to preach. But never indwelt them like he does us. This is a privilege. That's why he says your body is not your own. You are a temple of the holy God. You have been bought with a price. Act like it. Remember God dwells inside of you if you are his child he's not off in the cosmos he's in you that's why it says don't grieve the Holy Spirit don't grieve the Holy Spirit because he's inside of you now chapter 2 Paul talks about struggling for the believers in prayer, I must remember, what have you been given that wasn't granted? Beg God, right? My eyes don't swell up with tears for the lost. Well, beg God. Help me to see them the way you see them. Not the way I see them. Help me to see those people who don't deserve love, like Christ on the cross. Forgive them, Father. For they don't know what they're doing. I tell you, man, somebody punches me in the right side, it's going to be really hard for me not to knock their block off. But I want love like Jesus Christ. 
I don't want to be me. I don't want to have that pride that I was taught as a young boy. You're Irish. You don't let nobody pick, pick on you. You fight. I can hide behind that excuse. Or I can say, no, I must change. I must be conformed to the image of Christ. When someone persecutes me, I bless them. Now, Paul wants them to make sure no one takes them by empty deceit or philosophy here in chapter 2. He says it very clearly. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. There are a lot of preachers preaching a lot of things. Making money, deceiving people. God does not want us to be taken captive. He wants us to be solid upon the gospel. The gospel is for Christ and His glory, for us to be regenerated, for us to be born again into the family of God. Christ is the firstborn among the dead, meaning when sin entered the world, everything died. Now He's recreating everything. He calls us to be joined into that recreation that one day He will dwell with His people, we will dwell with Him forever. Forever. He doesn't want us to be caught off with this. You come to Christ and He will save everything. Your marriage is going to work out. Your mortgage is going to be paid. You're going to get a promotion. You're going to get a Mercedes. You're going to get all. You're going to get. You're going to get. You're going to get. No. No. I heard a man say one time, Jesus Christ promises you two things. A cross to die on and eternal life. That's... That's the gospel. You come to Christ, you receive eternal life. Now get on the cross and die to yourself. We need to tell people that and we need to tell ourselves that. I know people who come to Christ, the minute they start walking with Him, everything goes wrong. Remember, in this world you will have trouble, but I have overcome the world. Right? Now, He wants us to be rooted Think of it, roots, rooted, built up in Him, and established. What does the word established mean? Established in the faith, not babies, not being taken captive by plausible arguments. Somebody coming to you and teaching you the Bible, saying all of these things, and in one day having you drink Kool-Aid and die. We all laugh. That happened. Women and children died because a man came to them and said they had the way. They had the same Bible we do. And they drank it and died. Don't be taken captive. It doesn't even have to be that extreme. It can be just one thing off. That there's another way except for Christ. He's not the only way. I've seen two prominent preachers get on Larry King Live and say that to millions of people. Hey, these are nice guys, man. They got suits. You know? They're nice. They smile. They even talk with a southern drawl. You know, I mean, how can they be wrong? Can't be wrong. No. Don't be taken captive by empty deceit and philosophy. Know the scriptures. They're written to you and me so that we will be without excuse. Every one of us has a Bible, and if you don't, I'll give you one. No excuse. We must know truth. Now, he also says here in chapter 2 that through the cross, we have been made alive, and our sins have been forgiven. Read it. Right here, verse 13. And you, who were dead in your trespasses, in the uncircumcision of your flesh. Remember we learned that circumcision was always about your heart? It's a sign, but it's always about your heart. If your heart is uncircumcised, then it's still hard. Hard as a rock. I will remove your heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh. Stone's dead, has no life in it. Therefore, before Christ, you're dead. 
You are born dead, every single one of us. In sin did my mother consume, or conceive me. Right here. And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together in him. Same thing, Ephesians chapter 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. By nature, objects of his wrath. But God, who is rich in love, made us alive in him. Back to Colossians. Made us alive together in him. Having forgiven us all our trespasses. It doesn't say part of them. It says all of them. <laughs> That's amazing. It's like the song. Oh, the bliss of the wonderful thought of my sin, not in part, but in whole. All of them. Not the ones before you came to Christ, but all before, all present, and all future. Now, some's heart says, whew, boy, that's good because... Next Saturday, I got a party coming up. No, by no means. Right? Romans chapter 6. We have been dead. And how are we to live in sin? So that grace may abound? No, by no means. When you understand that all of your sins have been forgiven, they were slammed upon the Lamb of God, the innocent one for you, that motivates you to obey. One of the things as I was studying this week, I was asking the Lord, Lord, what does Christian maturity look like? And overarching, I, I could sense the Holy Spirit saying, it's not about knowledge. It is not about spitting out theology of your mouth, but it's living that theology out. That's the difference. I keep having to ask myself, is this a reality in my life? I may know what it says. I may be able to preach it to you, but is it a reality in my life? The mark of Christian maturity is obedience to what he has said. Primarily in love. If I have all wisdom and knowledge and prophecy, if I have faith to move mountains, if I speak in the tongue of angels, but I have not love. I am to be pitied because I have nothing. Obey. We always try to figure out what God's will is for our life. Where should I go? What should I do? Those things are good and we should ask God for them. But primarily, just obey what He has said. Start there. Now, let no one disqualify you. And watch out for man-made rules. Legalism. Look at verse 20. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why as if you still alive in the world do you submit to its regulations? Verse 21. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. According to the human precepts and teachings, these are indeed an appearance of wisdom and promoting self-made religion. We will not be a church that is going to sit there and point the finger at everybody and every little thing that they do and be critical about every little thing that they do. We will be a church that is based upon the Word of God. We will have church discipline. Why? Because that's what the Scripture teaches. God wants a pure church, but not, not to go on beyond what is written in the Scriptures and start making up our own rules. Can't go to dances. Can't go to the movies. Can't have a glass of wine after work. Can't have any of this stuff. Why? Because it's of the devil. Ha! No. That puts a burden on people that they cannot follow. It becomes strenuous. Slavery. That's not the will of God. What is? You have been saved for freedom. Freedom in Christ. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Remember that. We are to look after one another. We are to speak into each other's lives. If I'm drinking a bottle of wine a day, then I, I hope somebody would say, hey, this is not God's will for you. 
Do not be drunk on wine, but be filled up with the Holy Spirit. What's going on in your life that you have to have a 12-pack every day? Why? Why are you running to that? Oh, I'm tired. i got to relax. No. No. What, what is that giving you that the Holy Spirit cannot? Or I'll strike a nerve with this one, too. Some, some people say, oh, well, you know, God gave us the plant. You know, he gave it to us. It's good for us. Yeah, he gave us mistletoe, too. Be careful. Be careful. Why? Because we're to have a clear mind, a sober mind, to be watchful. The devil is like a lion prowling around, seeking whom he may devour. And if you're going to a substance for comfort, you're going to a substance for peace, to relax, be very careful. John Owen said, human beings are idle factories. We'll make an idol out of anything. Be very careful. But let's not be a church of legalism. Be a church of the Word of God. Be humble enough if someone does come and bring something to your attention to say, thank you, brother, thank you, sister, that you loved me enough to come talk to me about that. I was in El Paso a few weeks ago by myself. And about 6.30 in the morning, I get a text from a friend of mine. He says, hey, I just wanted to check and make sure your eyes are still pure. I thanked him for that. I wasn't like, oh, oh, oh. why is he saying that to me? Oh. No, I called him. I said, thank you that you cared enough to say something. Because us Americans, we live our lives so fast. We don't speak into each other's lives. We don't take time to sit down and say, how goes your soul? How are you doing is there anything I can pray for you about? We're so focused on what's going on in our own lives. Step outside yourself for a moment. Put your hand on somebody and give them a hug. Pray for them. Encourage them. Hey, folks, we're all hurting. Not one of us in this room is sitting here saying, oh, I got it all figured out. I'm doing great. Yeah, well, <laughs> give yourself about 10 minutes. <laughs> the rain's coming. It's in the forecast. In this world, you'll have trouble. Let's live our lives in community. Now, chapter 3. The Apostle Paul starts here with practical living, telling us not only that Christ is supreme, He is God in the flesh, but now he begins to tell us how we are to act in community. And the first thing he says is, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Man, if I could have that tattooed on my eyeballs. Because I read it, but I soon forget. Let's not forget, okay? Let's go the rest of this day seeking the things that are above, taking the thoughts that come to pull us away from that captive, making them obedient to Christ. Now, Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things of the earth. If you're spending more time looking at why DeMarcus Murray went to the Eagles, then you are in the Scriptures, there's a problem. There's a fundamental priority problem. If you're spending too much time looking at who's going to win the voice, and who's going to win the idol, American Idol, and who's going to do what in the People magazine, there's a fundamental problem. And 2,000 years ago, Paul gives us a remedy. Seek the things that are above, not the things that are on earth. They'll distract you. They don't satisfy. They don't. They're not food. Now, verse 5. We are to put to death the things that are earthly in us. What are those things? Well, it tells us. Number one, sexual immorality. Put it to death. Put it off. Put it away. If it's things that you are watching on the internet, stop. If you need help, ask a Christian brother to help you or sister. Come out. Stop living in darkness. Stop living a lie. God knows. You can't mock him. If you're living with your girlfriend or boyfriend and y'all are in sexual relationships, stop. That's not God's will for you. 
Put it away, impurity, passion, evil desires, covetedness. Sometimes us preachers spend a little bit too much time on the sexual immorality and we forget covetedness. What is that? Desiring things that are not yours. God hasn't given them to you. The, sh the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There's nothing wrong with desiring things. That's not what I'm saying. But the desire where that becomes your God. That becomes you think that's what's going to get you joy. If I could just buy that car, or if I could just buy that house, then I'd have joy. And as soon as you buy it, it turns, it's like a mirage. It's a, it's a carrot that you never can get to. Why? Because Christ designed you, right? He created all things. And He created you to have one desire that would fulfill you, and that is Him. Apart from Him, you can do nothing. Let us learn that now. Let us learn that now. Apart from Him, you can do nothing. Now, put on the new self. Because we learned that when you become a Christian, you become alive. You're born dead. You have no relationship with God. You can't. Why? Because a dead man can't. Right? Dead man can't hear. Dead man can't talk. Dead man can't do nothing but be dead. So you've got to be born again. You've got to be, become alive, regenerated. When you do that, the evidence of that is you walk in the newness of life. And what does that look like? Well, we have an image here. Look at verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy. Holy means to be separate, unique, set apart. And beloved, this is what we're to put on. Now, don't think of the other person. Often we do that when we hear sermons. We're always thinking of someone else, right? Oh man, I wish so and so could hear this. <laughs> no, think of yourself and ask yourself as we go through this. Put on compassionate hearts. If your heart is not filled of compassion, throw off the hardness, put on the compassion. Kindness. Are you kind? It's a choice. You can choose to be kind. Humility. You can choose to be humble. Meekness and patience. Do you have patience? I didn't yesterday. Boy, I tell you, that radiator and the bolts trying to get it back in the right place, I was real close to damaging that because if you hit a radiator, it'll leak. You know, you can't, you don't want to hit it. I'm getting off subject. But I did not have patience yesterday. But I can choose today to have patience. To be long-suffering when the kids are going bananas. I can choose to have patience. Speak a kind word. Be firm. Discipline them in the Lord. But have patience. Don't be so set with a short fuse all the time. Bearing with one another in love. If one has a complaint against another, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. This is one of the big ones of Christians. If, you're, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, but yet you are unwilling to forgive a brother or sister in Christ, you have a big problem with the Father. If you are unwilling to forgive men, I am unwilling to forgive you. That's what the Bible says. So how do you do that? Because sometimes it's not very easy. Sometimes it's Christians, that, or so-called Christians, that hurt us the most. I mean, scars that, that run deep. So what do you do? Well, you pray, first of all. You go to God and you say, I don't have even one inch of forgiveness in my heart for so and so. I am so upset at them. God, suffer in my heart. Help me to have the heart of Christ. Help me to see them the way you see them and be obedient to the Sermon on the Mount and bless those who persecute me. Pray for my enemies, not only those who love me, but also the ones that hurt me. I mean, that's totally foreign to, to us, to, to, to the sinful nature, to the world. That's completely foreign. But help me, God. I need your help. The desire to forgive 
is where it starts. If you at least can have the desire, God can work with that. So put that on. Now, what does it say binds it all together? What binds it all together? This constant theme. Love. Love binds it all together. Because guess what? You can be a hypocrite and have patience and compassion, humility, passive aggressiveness. But love is the main ingredient. It's, it's the ingredient. It doesn't matter if you have all the rest. If you don't have love, you just might as well be, be having hate. Might as well. So if you don't have love, beg God for it. I don't have love. But your spirit is in me, so help me. You live by faith. This, this is why Jesus constantly was rebuking the disciples, and he constantly rebukes me. Oh, you of little faith. Have faith. Don't walk by sight. Walk by faith. Faith is a muscle. You've got to exercise it. One way you do that is by acknowledging you don't have what you need. People that don't pray, those are people who, who think they have what they need. They go around walking through life being self-sufficient, self-sustained. That's not what God's looking for. I roam the earth to and fro seeking someone that will tremble at my word and walk with his God humbly. I just took a couple of scriptures and, and pieced them together, okay? I love, uh, I love you guys that come and say, which scripture was that? That's good. We're being like Bereans. We should be checking to see what comes out of my mouth is right. And I, I, uh, so I'm prefacing. I, I just took two or three of them and put them together. All right. Chapter 4. We learned that we are to be a witness for Christ. So be a witness within your sphere of influence. Not every single one of us is going to be a Billy Graham. Not every single one of us is going to be a Hudson Taylor. But every single one of us is going to be an individual. We are all people. And if we're in God's household, you have a sphere of influence. So whether that's your family, whether that is your job, your school, whether or not you're in prison, like Paul, you have a sphere of influence. So be a witness there. Pray that God would keep a door open. Like I said last week, Paul had to pray for a door to be open because it was illegal to talk about Jesus Christ. We don't have to pray for that. We have a door open. The door is wide open, but we don't do it. We don't say a word. We shut down. Oh, I don't know what to say. Simple. Say what God has taught you. Say about Jesus' life, Jesus' death, and Jesus' resurrection. And you say, that's it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's it. His life, His death, His resurrection. The power is in that message, not in you. Say the message. Oh, that's too simple. That's the point. It's not supposed to be about you and your eloquent way of presenting it. Just present it. Be wise how you act towards outsiders. We learned that. you you got to be consistent. If your life is inconsistent with Jesus, you have no witness. You can't tell somebody to come to the Lord when you're far from Him. Your life must be consistent. Don't be a lone ranger. We learned that. You must be part of a body. Now, the final greetings. Verse 7. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that we may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place. Our I can't say that. Articutus, my fellow prisoner, greetings to you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, 
concerning whom you received the instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you. Always struggling on your behalf in prayers. I say it like that because who are you struggling for in your prayers? That you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And see to it that you read the letter from Laodicea. And say to our our Chichapas, <laughs> sorry, that you fulfill the mis- ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. And remember my chains. Grace be to you. A couple observations from this final greeting. Paul was in a community of believers. And that community was not isolated among themselves. They wanted more than anything to see the glory of God elevated and churches birthed. And guess what? These guys also had jobs. They did other things other than just ministry all the time. Physician, or uh, Luke was a doctor. Paul made tents. I mean, these people had other things to do. But their focus was on Christ and the body of Christ being built up. Look how they struggled for one another. That's what it says, constantly struggling on your behalf. One thing you see about this is that they loved one another with a deep, deep love. How many of our churches are filled with people that love one another? So many people sit next to each other on Sundays and they don't even know each other across this country. They don't even know each other's name. If you're sitting next to someone, you don't know their name, find out. Find out their name. You get to know each other. Now listen, what did it say here about Nympha? Greet her or him. I'm not sure if Nympha is a male or a female. I didn't look into that. I should have. Greet Nympha and the church in her house. The church didn't meet in a cathedral. Where'd they meet? Each other's homes. Like life groups. Smaller communities. That's, that's the first century church. Paul and the teachers went from house to house teaching and encouraging the believers. Now, yeah, they did meet in temple courts on the Lord's Day, which was Sunday. But they had a pattern here that I want us to have, that the leaders of this church want us to have. And that's love for one another, encouraging one another, meeting in each other's homes and life groups. I'm going to say that every time I get up here. Here's something I want us to be left with. One thing is for sure about the early church. They were marked by love. Is love your mark? Is love your mark? If people you know were to talk about you, will they say you are loving? You're a loving person. If the answer is no, be honest about it. So number one, acknowledge it. And then number two, Aim for that. Aim for that. Why? Because that was the mark of Christ. That was the mark of Christ. He had compassion on people. Oh Lord, if you are willing, you'll heal me. He said, I am willing. He said he had a bunch of people. He had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He had 5,000 people out in the middle of the field in the heart of the day. Feed them. And he fed them. Have compassion and let your mark be of love. And that concludes the book of Colossians. I wanted to thank every one of you for giving me the opportunity and the privilege to preach for these last few months. I am very grateful. It has been, um, it's been a great privilege 
This coming week, John will return to the pulpit, and he will be preaching full time. And I'm excited to hear what the Lord is going to teach us through him. Well, let's pray. Oh, great God. Lord, help us to be people marked by love. I'm reminded that in Antioch, your word tells me in the book of Acts, that your people were first called Christians there. And they didn't call themselves Christians. It was people that were outside of the church that called them Christians. It was a name that they were given by people around them. And Lord, I'm reminded what that means. Little Christ. They were so much like Jesus. They were his disciples and tried to be like him so much. The people around them were the ones that were calling them little Jesuses. God, I pray that we would be a people that would look like you, marked by love and compassion and humility. We would speak the truth in love and be a witness in our sphere of influence. That we would stand for Christ and realize that the days are short. And that we would bring you much glory until you return. Thank you for today, God. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.